Um, so yeah, Stu, you, you'd like to introduce Rebecca and then we can yeah, pass sure. over to Simon. I'm, I'm thrilled to have Rebecca here tonight. She, uh, she earned her KM stripes way on back in uh, 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 Melbourne Water, uh, which is where I first came across her with the Knowledge Management Roundtable. And uh, I met a lot of people through that experience, but Beck really stood out. She's a, a lone wolf. She gets out there and she thinks of ideas outside the norm. And I love that about her. She's worked um, uh, more lately in the Microsoft 365 and become a really well-known international speaker in that area. Uh, and I love the fact that she can run these programs. She can facilitate, which for me is a huge skill with knowledge managers. And if that all doesn't work, she can hit you with a sword and knock you out. So I want to kill a combo. Uh, but most importantly, she's wonderful at getting people to collaborate. And I couldn't think of a better person to talk about this topic tonight. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll hand over to Simon. And Simon, when you're done, you can pass on to Rebecca. Thank you, Stu. Thank you, Simon. And uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for this opportunity. As I mentioned earlier, uh, I've been a long time listener, first time presenter. Um, I've been coming to these sessions on and off since about 2007, which I, uh, I shared earlier. So um, I'm quite pleased to be able to be in this role tonight and share some um, my experience. Um, Simon shared a bit of a convoluted title and what I do, which uh, was from the information I gave him. Essentially, I work in learning and development. Okay, I work with organizations to define their, define their learning and development strategy and also help do evaluation of their learning and development. So I operate at the bookends of learning and development, but I also do a lot in the middle around facilitating workshops, programs, designing workshops and programs, either one-on-one -on -one or group. And my focus is leadership development. So obviously has a lot with collaboration, uses a lot of uh, collaborative tools, a standard whiteboard, flip charts and that sort of thing. But when the pandemic came along and we were all forced into our little caves, we had to learn new ways of doing things. And uh, I quickly ascertained there's quite a few products on the market. And I did a bit of research as to what was out there. And I knew that Miro, M-I-R-O, and Mural, M-U-R-A-L, were positioned as, well, marketed as two of the leading ones. They're very, very similar in their look and feel. Uh, I decided to go with Mural. And um, I'm not sure, is that what, um, Beck, you use, Mural as well? I use Mural mostly in my day-to-day -day now because that's what I have access to through work. But I've had some experience with Miro over the years. And you're absolutely right. There's a lot of crossover in the functionality. I think, you know, it'd be hard to kind of put them up against each other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, and I believe, Stu, you focus on Miro. So it'll be good that uh, I know I'm sharing Mural. I assume Beck's sharing Mural and Stu, you'll be doing Miro. So it'll give you guys a good opportunity to at least explore two different versions. Um, so what I'd like to do is share my screen, um, but it says it's disabled. Um, so could um, Simon or Stu enable me to share my screen? Okay. Right, there we go. So hopefully you can see my screen now, which is essentially the mural homepage. And that's my space. You see up in the top left-hand corner, that's, that's bads to me. So I've actually um, taken up a subscription, a basic level subscription. I survived for a while on the free version, but with free versions, as you know, they give you basic functionality and essentially limited storage of, of um, uh, canvases. So I did, um, when I, once I confirmed that this was a tool for me, I did um, lash out and get a basic level um, license, which gave me some more functionality, not the full functionality, but I'm happy with what I've got. And also I get unlimited um, canvases to play with. So my home screen, um, I can also just focus in on my particular murals. Uh, there's a tab there with a whole lot of templates. Um, Mule has a lot of templates and they keep adding to them and they're quite good. They aligns a lot to the agile uh, and lean methodology, a lot of um, CX 
um, quite designed. So it's a lot of people that work in those professions that really, really seem to make a lot of use of these sort of tools and update the, the templates. And another thing I liked about uh, Mural was that uh, there was a good access to learning tools. They have lots, lots of short little videos that you can play, little how-to guides, and it's been quite good. I've, I've solved, I've answered any, many questions and solved many issues just by referring to the, um, the learning functions there. So I have a number of canvases I use. Um, I use them in one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with executives and I'm uh, pretty exhausted today. I've had about three sessions just today on uh, coaching um, people online use, using this tool. I also run team workshops uh, for groups via um, using Mural and Zoom. So I have gone and um, as all good chefs do, here's one I prepared earlier. So I have called up a Mural that I've called KMLF collaborative workspace examples. And this is basically a mural that's highly populated, but the thing I like about it is I can reveal content when I wish to. And you have a full access to the um, outline down the side and you see the, the bold ones are the, the headings that are displayed and all the other ones which are kind of grayed out. I know they're there and I can reveal them when I want to. So you can kind of drip feed the content and the sessions you want to. So I know I've got a, some time, but I don't want to monopolize it, but I would like to go through the four different ways that I use the mural canvas. And the first way is I use it as part of my one-on-one -on -one Atlas coaching sessions. So this is when I do one-on-one -on -one sessions. I use it in my uh, team workshops. And I also create and design what I call consequential scenarios that I can have discussions with groups or individuals, either as part of a formal workshop or even as part of a, a, um, a strategy session. And also I um, just start to play around design some other activities. I know you can't see anything yet, but I will reveal all shortly. So as you can see, I just, just click on a space in my outline and it will zoom in to that particular space. And once other users come in and they'll be, their icons will be populated down here. This is my icon here, the, the big B. Um, other users will be populated alongside me and I get a lot of other functionality as soon as there's other users, such as I can summon people to that space. I can control where their cursor is. So I can have a little bit of control over where they are but obviously the intent often is just to allow people to um, do activities uh, as, in, as in freely as they uh, wish to or, or in line with the directions that are given. So what I'll, I'll do is just quickly go through some of the activities um, that I have in the one-on-one um, -on -one coaching sessions. So I start off with this little introduction area and I get people to basically click on this area, write their name, put their title and briefly describe what they do and you know what how many direct reports they might have the time in their role and then I get them to actually this is this person's had two coaching sessions so at the start of session one they responded to this question how effective do you feel as a leader they responded that this was about a three and today during this person's session they've actually feel that their effectiveness has dropped because there's been a number of significant issues that have um um, uh, occurred for them, but their enjoyment is, uh, is actually still maintained high. So I have this little area at the start to allow people to kind of start to play around with it. These areas are locked. You'll, you might be able to see as a, as a, um, a padlock symbol there, which means that's locked, but I've opened up these other spaces, a free form and a person can actually type content in there. So this gives them an opportunity to kind of get used to using neural uh, at the early stage. So, and then I actually um, do an activity where I get them to focus on what work activities they're doing. And I ask them to think about what they're doing on a weekly basis. And the top quadrant is work activities that give me a sense of accomplishment over on the right, work activities that I'd rather be doing, and down the bottom, 
work activities that, that I am avoiding or resisting and work activities that are holding me back or I do reluctantly. So I get them just to populate that and I color code them to make sure that they align up. So this gives me a great opportunity to then have a conversation based on any, any items that are really, really kind of triggering for them or it might be issues. So even though we've got space and distance separating us and we're operating via Zoom and we don't have the uh, opportunity to read people's body language or that which traditionally is beneficial in a coaching session, having a, a coachee be able to input this sort of stuff and I'll give them time and space to do that does really allow them A, to get used to using this tool very, very quickly it does allow us to build some sense of rapport very quickly and it also gives us a ground rules and some dialogue to actually have some ongoing conversations with uh, going forward and there's some other tools that i i use uh, this is an appreciative inquiry tool um, strengths opportunities aspirations and results and just a matter of double clicking anywhere and creating a sticky as soon as i start writing on it that sticky is, is there and I can move it around. Um, you get a little taskbar up here to change the color. You can change the, um, the size of it. Uh, you can increase the fonts. You can do a lot of things you, you want to. So when we have these sort of conversations, um, I can actually um, uh, challenge them or probe deeper and get them to qualify and I might move an item around um as a result of our conversation and that's essential part of of um coaching another uh tool that i use which is a bit more interesting a bit more away from the, the normal is um a metaphor box and in the outline here you see there's full instructions that the coach you can actually understand so basically this is about using metaphors and i might say choose an issue that's really really um uh, problematic for you at the moment and they might just say, oh, well, um, it's really about not, not being able to find um, greater work-life balance. And I would then say, well, you know, what, what's really important in your life at the moment? What really matters? They might say, well, it's my, my family. Uh, I'm missing out on, on traveling. Um, and my, my finances uh, are really, really in, getting impacted. And then I might say, well, so what, what things might be standing in the way of, of that? And they might say, oh, well, you know, it's the people at work you know, being you know, really, really tormenting me. It's, it's the amount of lack of direction I've got. So this metaphor tool really, and I'm moving this at the moment, but I would be asking the coachee to actually be moving these around and they feel free. They can change the color of it if it really resonates to them with them they can change the um the position they can make it bigger if it's a really really big issue if this person is really really kind of a blocker for them i can encourage them to actually move around if they're feeling really separated from their family the position of where they actually put these items really really uh allows them to articulate what the issue is and it allows me to actually probe and dig further so I could never really do this sort of stuff in the one-on-one -on -one, face to face sort of vibe. You could to a degree, but I'm finding this tool is so versatile that allows me to open up some different ways of thinking um, for the coaches and to really, really allow them to tap into different ways of communication. And we're obviously going through at a very advanced pace now, but my coaching sessions are typically 60 to 90 minutes and the pace of them is a lot more measured and a lot more focused and in tune and calibrated to each individual person. So no, no way would I be running a coaching session at this pace or with me doing anywhere near as much talking as this. And lastly, I also, um, in these one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions, I have like an, an action plan uh, area. And this is pretty simple. I have an illustrative example here. Um, so I've just created stickies and you've got um, these connectors here. So if you move one around, the other ones will obviously stay, can, uh, stay joined. So it's quite versatile um, when you can actually create stuff. The other great thing about um, using these, these tools, it's, you know, as I said, I've always demonstrated stickies and you can change colors. You can put text box in and uh, type some, some text as needed, um, a heading for something. Um, you can uh, also talk some uh, comments. So you can actually put a comment in here as a reference point. And particularly if you've got a number of other users, you can actually um, 
uh, incorporate a, a dialogue. It's like the chat space we have in, in um, Zoom. And um, there's a lot of shapes and connectors you can, you can put in, put in um, some shapes and connectors. And as I've demonstrated there, what's just not working at the moment. It, it is a bit tricky sometimes trying to get used to, there we go. And so you can quite easily do all sorts of flow charts and things like that. Uh, you can put in other um, grids and uh, quite easily just drag and drop, and then you can resize them um, and you can add to them. This uh, action planning tool here was just a standard grid and I added a few other components to it. I created my own headings by using like this text box, something like that. So you can get quite creative at how you want to do it. It also allows you to um, uh, input um, GIFs. Um, it has a direct link to um, uh, Unsplash, which is a, a free, a license free um, um, image is. So you just type in um, uh, an image uh, type in something to search by and it'll you just drag and drop that image in <clears throat> and that allows you to to you know populate any of your pictures or representations with um uh pictures or of course you can also do um icons which i like uh, in particular you can have um uh, icons you can drag and drop and create um or this one in particular that's quite good the um thumbs up, thumbs down icon. Whoops, so if you double click anywhere, it just creates a, um, a, a colored sticky. So you could do that, change the color to red and you might create a, uh, a thumbs up green one. And if you have some sort of um, decision thing, you can, um, you can uh, use that. So some other really, really good functionality I like about um, Mural is that uh, you have, well, first of all, you have the undo. So anything you uh, do, you might have made a mistake, you can undo or redo. Um, you have a voting session. So you can actually create a voting session on uh, a particular area and get people to, to cast their votes. And then it will be able to display those votes. You can um, run an activity in private mode. So you might get people to populate a particular grid or matrix and they could work uh, in individually. So you, they won't see what each other's doing. So that really, really kind of overcomes groupthink and, and um, other ambiguities, other biases like that. And you can choose as to whether once you reveal whether the authors will be anonymous or everyone will then see what everyone has done. So that's quite a powerful tool as well. Um, and also you can have a, a pointer. So if you want to talk about a particular point, I can highlight that pointer as well. And uh, just waiting for, yeah, just get rid of that, um, a timer as well. We can have a, a countdown timer. So you can just, um, start the timer and then it'll just count down. You'll see the countdown clock, clock go. So, so that's how I do it in one-on-one -on -one coaching. And how am I going for time, Stu? I just do, do want to just check in. Maybe just a few more minutes if you can do that. Um, yep. It's all right, Tyron. Yep, okay. Uh, so just, just, so I do similar things in my um, team workshops. Uh, so similar sort of tools, the standard um, like uh, stakeholder map, um, the uh, impact effort matrix. So these are standard templates used uh, in, in um, uh, provided by Mural. So I haven't really added too much to that. Uh, but another interesting tool I like to do, particularly in a team workshop, is um, have a bookcase. And you might um, have an activity in, in say, okay, so that was the, uh, the sounder going off from, from a minute, so the, the timer. So you might say, um, now, what, what book has been really, really influential um, um, on you? So you just go a quick sit. Um, um,
and it should be able to drop in the image there. It's a bit flaky, but it's, um, there you go. And, and over the course of a workshop, you can add, uh, you get every, all the participants to add elements to that and you can expand the conversation around that as well. So uh, just another area I just like to um, uh, focus on is um, the other activities um, down the, yep, down the bottom. Just trying to get that off the screen. I've just got a hover over that's not scrolling off and I can't get rid of that sidebar. Okay. Um, and this activity here, I know you probably can't see that because I've got that side. I can't, can you see the top of my screen? I've got the zoom functions there and I can't actually get rid of them. Oh, there we go. Oh, they went and then they came back. So this activity here is um, you were having a, um, a conversation with your younger self. What advice would you give them and what might they be thinking about you? So this really kind of stimulates some, some thought uh, amongst people that might be a one-on-one -on -one coaching. It might be a group activity. And all this stuff I've just, kind of, I've just got from searching um, on the web uh, via Mural and just found this picture. And the activity is about no, just drag, drag and drop um, some speaking bubbles and then just fill some text in. And this, this person might be doing some um, uh, thinking about, about what they're doing. So, um, and, um, and, um, so it's a, it's an activity that, um, is quite thought, thought provoking and quite useful to stimulate conversations, as I said, either at the team level or, um, at, um, a, a, a individual level. So Simon, it's Luke here. Yes. Um, th these are super, super tools, uh, that you're using within this, within the whiteboard um whichever platform we we use i think the one question i have is um comparing this to face to face and and the distraction of the technology and the technology getting in the way i mean for me um this the physical sticky note and the and the sharpie and the butcher's paper i i still feel has such a tactile element and, and connects people you know the the ability to be able to hand uh, a pen from one person to another mm -hmm. um this is obviously from your perspective being able to reach people all around the globe and I, and I get that the value of you know being able to connect with somebody in new york and run a session with them but what, what are your thoughts around the technology and it getting in in the way or the hurdles okay. you've had to overcome Look, it is a great thing that I've had to really um, ask. And I guess at the moment, it's quite um, a particular client. I'm doing a lot of coaching. I'm running uh, 50 coaching sessions for a client. And they've all been told to now scurry back home um, and not come face to face with everyone. So this is quite, you know, uh, working out quite well, the timing of this. I am able to use this even in a classroom setting. So you can actually have people... Uh, either have their own devices in a big training room and they actually all do it. So we've got the benefit of having that face-to-face -face interaction, but each person has their own device that they can then interact the, on the canvas with. Or you just have one person, I can have a producer there helping me and that one producer takes ownership of updating everything on the mural, the, the stickies. Uh, I think uh, just as the world has um, broadly gone hybrid, I will adapt my ways to be back to hybrid by combining using this, even when I'm back face to face, using this in certain situations, uh, along with the standard butcher's paper whiteboard. Because for me, one of the big benefits is, is that I can actually download um, this and send um, a copy, a soft copy 
of the inputs to anyone I wish to, either myself or to any of the participants. So that copy is um, is retained um, in perpetuity because I've run so many sessions, uh, st strategy sessions or whatever using um, the sticky notes. And at the end of the day, people just leave the session and it's literally left up there and no one does anything about it. And I always used to make it a, a, a practice to sit there and type up everything that was written and capture that with using mural it's already there all i've got to do is just is save it to as a pdf and email that to everyone so everyone has got a copy so i think your question is very very valid generally and also for me to continue to consider but i'm i'm confident i'll be able to use this tool i'm confident there'll be a place for this tool um even in face-to-face -face sessions so i guess the big question is what about the hybrid environment where you've got 10 people in the room <clears throat> yeah look to uh, 10 people online and yep yeah, absolutely and that is a real um real challenge and i have colleagues um that actually um do um do run some training sessions on best how to do that i haven't as yet been in that situation but some of the practices you would do is try you try and have a in-room buddy so if there's say three people from home and seven people in the office each person from home would have a buddy in the room to make sure that they could easily check in with them with i can't hear or my audio's dropped out or whatever so that there's kind of like that that immediate access to make sure that hey guys like i can't hear you because no one's talking the microphone or you know what's going on um just to kind of have that that real-time connectivity so there are some some techniques you can actually kind of um minimize the the impact of having not everyone in the same room at the same time fantastic and there's also some good commentary coming through on the chat there as well thank you everyone Okay, so I'm conscious of the time. Um, I was fast, but uh, hopefully you got some value out of it. Um, and I'm happy to, um, if that's okay, um, stop sharing my screen um, and hand it back to um, Stu and Rebecca. Over to you, Beck. That was awesome. Thank you. I'm glad you showed mural in detail because I'm like, I don't have any murals that I can show because it's got client stuff on it. But that was such a great example from Simon. And I think this sort of audience really understands that, um, you know, to use a tool like that to its fullest preparation and practice is incredibly important. Um, but it's also the sort of thing that um, I'll often just use on the go without preparation. What I thought I'd do is I'll share. I've, um, I was paying attention to you, Simon, if it, like I was fiddling around. I'm setting up all my millions of devices here um, so I can do a bit of screen sharing with you. And I'm just bringing up um, our old mate, MS Whiteboard, because um, we all love um, MS Whiteboard because it's really awesome and full featured, right? Um, it's not always that we're in a position where we could use a tool like Mural or Miro. Um, sometimes a tool like MS Whiteboard is what we have access to. Um, and the way I like to think of um, MS Whiteboard is like if I'm in a meeting with someone and we're trying to discuss a concept or come together on, on an idea, I can bring it up really, really quickly and just start sketching. Um, and I think this is why um, yeah, I was thought of for this session because um, I've got like three tablets in front of me in different different styluses because it's kind of like what I like to do um, and for client work um, clients really love it it's really engaging to to be able to bring up um, you know a bit of a whiteboard situation and just put it on screen um, and sometimes it might be that it's um, less collaborative and more just sharing. And I still think of that as collaboration though. Like even though I'm sharing my screen and I'm kind of the one doing the whiteboarding, um, it's kind of, you know, I'm here doing a presentation and you're all seeing it over here. 
but you're still engaged in the process, right? You're still part of the process. Um, with Whiteboard, MS Whiteboard, I can invite other people in and I've done that before. Um, the thing with MS Whiteboard is it's much looser than a tool like Mural or Miro. You don't have as many controls. So the more people you bring in, the messier it gets, but sometimes um, the, the, the mess is really good. Um, so for me, you know, whiteboard is really handy just to do some quick sketching. Like I might, you know, bring bring in a client and be like, okay, you know, we're talking about um, a new intranet design. So what sort of structure do you want? Let's talk about that structure and let's move that structure around and just put boxes on the page. And is this what we want? Do we agree? Throw some ticks, ticks and crosses on there and things like that. Where um, a tool like Miro or Mural really starts to come into power is the incredible depth and control you have of features. So Simon was showing um, that you can lock things down and you can hide things. Um, and one of the challenges that I'm sure, you know, give, give me a thumbs up if you've experienced this, running a workshop um, in a digital context and people just go ahead and jump, you know, three steps ahead of what you're doing because you've given them access to the board and they're like, cool, I'm going to jump in and do all the things and get all excited. And you, you've got no control over the situation. The cool thing about a mural and a Miro is you can actually, um, through the tools, lock things down, hide things, bring people through the journey so you can still have that semblance of workshop control um, while, while using, um, you know, like a Miro or a mural. Um, and they are really similar in in my experience. I don't know what what a Venn diagram of the two looks like, but um, I, I wouldn't say having one or the other is giving you a lesser experience. It's like what can you afford or what does your organisation give you access to? Um, what limitations might you have around um, what you can do with your your clients or customers in that sort of digital environment? But from a functionality perspective, they're pretty similar. What's happening with Whiteboard, though, is they're starting to bring in more of um, the mural-like functions. Um, and, you know, Stuart knows I'm pretty pragmatic about Microsoft stuff. Um, I don't think it's ever going to be Miro, Miro or Mural, and I don't think they're going to try to do that. But what they're trying to do is bring in a bit of that functionality for people who don't have access to the fancy, funky tools. Like, if your company's got a license to M365 and um, that's all that you can get, then it does give you the ability to do some really cool stuff. So hopefully this is um, reasonably visible as I um, pour away at my touchpad here. Um, but they've got, you know, all of these different little, you know, affinity diagram, brain writing. There's even more in here that I'm seeing now than the last time I looked a couple of weeks ago. Um, they're adding more and more of these little templates, games um, that you can put in here, um, retrospective. So if you're in a position where, MS Whiteboard is all you have access to. Um, have another look at it if you haven't looked at it for a while, because the drawing features are getting really, really good. But even just these templates and being able to post it note and things like that means that you can get that. Sorry, that's my keyboard being special. Um, get that same kind of functionality. What you're going to not get is that extra level of detail, like being able to, you know, do a big map where you can click into different agendas and sections and, um, you know, uh, timers and that kind of stuff. But for the most part, I find for impromptu things, this is more, more than enough and definitely worth exploring. Yeah. The way I kind of, sorry. I just, I just wanted to add while you were on those topics that mm. uh, it is absolutely on the roadmap to be able to, export to Excel uh, in the near future as well, which is obviously a key element. Um, yeah, I mean, like the benefit of MS Whiteboard is that integration with, you know, Teams. Um, if you've got, uh, you know, Surface Hubs are popping up all over the place. Um, we're working with a client at the moment and they just bought a, a bunch for one of their buildings. So they're becoming more affordable for organisations and they're also more incentivized to bring them in. So if you've got a Microsoft Surface Hub, you can run a Teams meeting, have MS Whiteboard in there. Um, share that whiteboard with people all over the place, have them sketching and drawing and things all at the same time. Um, and more commonly, I'm seeing that companies are, are comfortably provisioning tablet-like devices. Um, so I've had a couple of roles now where a Surface Pro has been part of the standard um, environment. I know not everyone gets that luxury, but I'm seeing it more and more often. I'm fortunate enough that for my 
current consultancy gig, I managed to convince them to give me a HP um, tablet because I knew they were going around. And I thought if I asked nicely, I might get one. Um, and then I've also got an iPad that I use in my personal life as well. So lots of different options for doing the sketching piece. But even if you don't like the sketching, the post-its and the text and reactions and things like that are, are really, really functional um, and really, really easy to use. So I think like for um, for me, in my experience with Miro and, and Mural, if I, if I group them together as kind of, you know, a bit more of the fun, funkier tool, there's two ways um, that I use them. Uh, I'm just going to use Mural because that's the one I, I use more commonly at the moment. So I'll use them as a more as a whiteboard, like I'm doing for you now in this little MS whiteboard, excuse my handwriting, um, or for like full collaboration. Now, if you're just using it for a whiteboard type thing, like to throw up ideas, incredibly powerful and you don't have to do as much kind of preparation and set up necessarily depending on you know who's your audience maybe you need it to be shiny because it's for a client or whatever but I find a lot of the time just doing this whiteboarding thing having a conversation and bringing up MS whiteboard or mural and having a space where you know we can do a quick brainstorm with a bunch of post-it notes and pull them together um, do you know a bit of a sketching of a diagram and as Simon said exporting that as an output um, and having that as a resource going forward is super, super useful. And that's without having to worry about the hurdles of, you know, does everyone have access to it? Does everyone have training? Does everyone know about the buttons and the clicks and all of that sort of stuff? That's still like super, super valuable. Then when you want to get into the collaboration side of things, for me, what's really important here is that you like prepare absolutely prepare. Um, you know, maybe if it's a small team, you'd be at, who's familiar with the tool, you'd be able to spin something up and, and kind of jump in together and have a back and forth. But if you're wanting to construct a workshop with a goal, like the stuff that Simon was showing, um, sitting down and designing your workshop in the same way that you might for an in-person workshop to think about like, what are, what are the goals? What do I want to achieve um, in the session? So, you know, like how much time do I need? Like how much time do I need to run this workshop? And we, ne we never have a, like we, we always try and cram so much into a workshop, right? Like you always need much more time than you think. So sitting down and thinking about how much time do I need? I need a warm up activity. Um, I need to do, you know, the first activity to like, um, if you think about it from a design thinking perspective, the first activity might be, you know, a, a brainstorm or, or, you know, kind of like a, um, a mass sharing of information and then your second activity might be um, something where you synthesize the the information so um, you know for km peeps in the room you know doing um, a little bit of affinity mapping a bit of a tree structure so you start like gathering all, all your information you do your second activity to put, synthesize it and then you do a little bit of a wrap up and with the board what you have at the end is a really really beautiful output to have that run well um, putting some structure in place, but also like when I'm doing a workshop, I'll look to all of the mural templates. I'll look through, um, there's a, 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 pla a place called Luma, um, which I've done some training with them and they have a bunch of design thinking templates. So I, I'll look through those, like, what am I trying to achieve? What activities do I need? And I'll put it together in a big board. I'll, I might road test it with someone in the team to say, hey, does this work? Um, lock it down and then run the workshop with, you know, a handy helper on the side is like, I'd say for any workshop, right? Um, always good to have someone who can help you on the side to kind of um, manage the process and conversations to, to stick to time and to help people kind of get past those hurdles of unfamiliar tools or, or working through the process. So for me, definitely, you know, I see a lot of really, really beautiful mural boards, like really like things that look like a work of art and those take a lot of effort for people to design. And I think there's definitely value in that, but also the, it being sexy is not the most important bit. It's much more important that it's functional and usable, that it's really clear and easy for people to use and they see a purpose in it. And I think, um, you know, I definitely miss 
in-person workshops and that tangible, you know, kind of post-it note experience. I've got like physical post-it notes all around my room here because I still like to do it. But having a mural or a Miro um, really allows some democratization of the experience. So if you do have people who are in different locations and maybe there's like six people who are in one room and two people who are, you know, in another building, another state, another country, um, inviting them to do it in the digital experience means that everybody's coming in on the same playing field. Um, so you can have a, have a situation where yet, like maybe there are people in the room having a discussion, but encouraging them and having that person on site to get them to engage in the digital experience means everybody comes in with the same opportunity to input, with the same access to the information and the same access to the outputs, um, which in a hybrid working environment becomes increasingly challenging um, I know I've certainly been that one person on the call who's not in the room and it's really difficult to feel engaged and be engaged in a workshop when that happens. With the digital platform, you can level that playing field. So I've kind of gone on a little bit of a rambling journey because um, Stuart's let me. Um, is there anything, um, yeah, can I answer any questions? Do you have any thoughts on that? Does it resonate? Does it not? I had no idea about, particularly about just using Microsoft Whiteboard, the sort of things you could do on that. Oh, I'm glad I could help with that. Actually, another thing that I was thinking of, although it crashed on me, I'm not going to do it because it might, um, PowerPoint's being a little bit funny, but um, I'm really, really um, big on using mark sketching tools in Microsoft 365. And I've got some links that I'll drop and share with you. Um, but I've been doing a lot of sketching in PowerPoint. So if you're sharing a PowerPoint presentation, you can use the draw functions in PowerPoint to do the same thing. Like if you've ever been at that point in a PowerPoint deck where everyone's like, no this, no that, or there's some discussion happening, I'll sometimes just drop a blank PowerPoint slide in and start sketching on that. And again, if you don't have a stylus, it doesn't need to be the sketching tools. Um, you could just use shapes and things like that. Um, similar features in Word, um, similar features in um, OneNote. I'm a big OneNote fan and I've been sketching in OneNote for uh, you know longer than I've been sketching in any of these other applications as well. The features are, um, are really incredible from a drawing perspective. And if you haven't played with it for a while, you'll be really pleasantly surprised about what you can do in there. I'll see if I can make it um, make it jump up for me so I can give you a quick show and tell. Brad, do you want to? Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Um, so for the to the panel, um, how do you manage virtual fatigue? I had this experience during the was the first the end of our first year in lockdown, and um, this particular group they were just exhausted from Teams meetings and using virtual tools. So no matter how engaging, um, you know, and how much. I encouraged ownership and gave them time to explore and to navigate and to do stuff and get them to do activities on the board as well. It was really hard. It was really hard work. So I'd be keen to hear thoughts on how you manage that if you've come across that. I've definitely come across it myself, like sitting and staring at a screen all day can be really tough. Mm. Um, interestingly, I did the Luma training I mentioned before that I did earlier in the year that was too four half day sessions across two weeks and we, we were basically in front of our desks in these tools for um four hours um they built breaks in and things like that and I think that's that's the key like if you need it to happen you've got to you know, plan, build breaks in, um, allow, you know, the bio break, encourage people to kind of step away, um, have a bit of music, have a bit of lightness and fun. Um, and I think also like have that really clear goal for people so they don't feel like, what are we, what are we doing this for? Why, you know, am I wasting my time if it, as long as it feels tangible? And that's not to say that I think any of that solves the problem for anyone fully, but um. Yeah, like acknowledging the challenges that people are having um, and, and building in human time into, in, into, into the day. I've just flicked PowerPoint um, up on my screen. It's not in presenter view. Um, you'll be able to see the, the 
draw menu. Um, so the basic drawing tools and I can um, sketch if I select the right thing, Rebecca, when you're doing a demo, there we go. I can sketch in here. I actually pushed the upper limits of this feature recently. I did a, a, an animated sketch note for an Avenard presentation where they're like, tell us a bit about yourself. And I just went nuts and did a whole animated sketch note fully in PowerPoint. Um, and I think I like, I, I hit the upper limit of how many strokes you can have on, um, on, on a PowerPoint page, but you can get um, in, incredibly detailed and granular with it. Um, and it's got this really cool feature, which you'll see in others. Um, so if I'm just hitting this button that says ink replay, which just makes me so happy every time I see it because I'm delighted by these sorts of things. Um, what I just did then in hitting ink replay, you can actually just use the normal animate features in PowerPoint and create like little animations and stuff. So if you're that way inclined at all, I suggest you have a look, but also I'm really big on, um, you know, it doesn't need to be sexy for it to be useful to people. Like, you know, it doesn't, just cause I can draw, you know, a human body, this is good enough and in fact more accessible for people. If you just do basic, you know, kind of things, um, people find it a lot more engaging. So I'll pause there. I'm sure I've probably gone over my allotted time, but I'll, I'll share some links to stuff if, you, if you're interested in the sketching side of things. I've got a few blogs. Um, and yeah, let me know if you think it's cool because I'm like always looking for other people who think the sketching stuff's fun. And if, if I could just jump in just to um, add to Rebecca's response to, to Brad's question about the fatigue, that it is a legitimate question, legitimate concern. Um, I guess because a lot of my stuff is one-on-one is -on -one coaching, um, I do work a lot harder to establish that rapport. Uh, I'm finding a lot of people have dual screens, so they might have the, the mural open in one screen and still have Zoom open in another screen. And having your camera on, you can have that, you know, make sure you are looking at the camera and having that, that, um, uh, that connection. Having said that, it's quite obvious when people are looking at their other screen and particularly they've got glasses and you can see that they're, you know, responding to emails or they, you'll just, you might hear a faint notification in the background and you'll see them just like, like almost mouthing the words and you'll see their whole body language change. So depending on the dynamics of the situation, I will ask a pro probing question or a challenging question. You know, so what is happening for you right now? And just try and snap them back into that to maintain that, that umbilical cord of human connectivity. Other than that, everything that Beck said about you know, having breaks, um, no, if I'm running a workshop, no more than 90 minutes without some sort of break. Uh, mix it up, have some sort of energizer, whether it's um, do something, go and find um, the, the favorite novel that um, inspired you the most and, and put that in the, the bookshelf. A lot of other activities where they actually have to go and search on the internet. So they're doing things and finding things and actually creating things and co-creating content to keep them stimulated and active so it's a lot you can do and um, when you have parameters it forces you to be more creative to overcome situations so i guess that's over to me thank you uh simon and beck that was awesome um i guess i'll 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 speak to those two issues i mean the first one is that that fatigue this is not a digital version of the real thing it's a different thing and so if you've got a half day workshop, think about how you can do that in 90 minutes. There are real efficiencies to doing it online. And we ran a series of half, four half day workshops. We did them in four 90 minute workshops. We got more output than we would have in the half day workshops because of the way everyone can collaborate at once, but uh, a lot less fatigue. So um, you know, don't, don't get caught in thinking it's just a digital version of, of, of a face to face workshop. But the other thing was Luke's question about um, uh, uh, you know, the disadvantages of doing it online as opposed to face-to-face. -face. And they're definitely there, but what we don't often talk about is the advantages of doing an online space. And the huge, um, the huge advantage, so much so that I now passionately defend this way of running workshops, is for the first time I've seen a way where introverts, find themselves suddenly with an equal voice 
And it's a wonderful thing to see people who have been in workshops with you for four, five, six years who have sat there and not said boo or goose. And suddenly they're writing the most amazing pieces of input and being brave with the words they're using and, and diving in in the middle and, and so much in some situations, actually then putting their camera on and saying something where they never would have if they hadn't have got themselves worked up by writing first. So I, you can tell I'm really excited about that part of this whole world and the, the voice that it's given to a lot of people. I, uh, for those who don't know, I work in emergency management. So we have a lot of people who are very confident and we have a lot of people who aren't necessarily and those two people are often in the same meeting. So you can imagine that this is a great, I can see Brad giggling away. Uh, you can imagine my excitement at, at giving these people a voice. So I'm not going to talk for long tonight. I'm going to give you a really quick, like, four-minute blaster intro to this stuff and some of the stuff we've done and uh, one or two of the things that we've got with Miro. And then we're going to learn by doing. I've, I've got an activity set up and we're going to think about how we use this technology to, um, to do our KM work. So if it's all right, I'm going to share my screen and, and we will go from there. Okay, so this is one of the workshops. I'm not going to drill in because it's obviously full of uh, um, uh, private information, but this is a workshop we've laid out. So remember when Beck was talking about two styles, there's presenting and then there's the collaboration. This is full on collaboration. So you can see there, we've even got a start here on the top left hand corner, guiding our people of where to go first. Uh, Miro has a function where you can set the initial view when people come into the board. And we, so we set that in the top left where we've got the presenters and the rules. And we actually had Arthur and Brad uh, helping facilitate this workshop. Uh, you can see that there's a table there. That's, um, that's all the people in the workshop and they were pre-assigned to teams. So what we would do is we would, we had three audio teams. So we'd break the, the Microsoft Teams into three uh, breakout rooms, but they all stayed on the one board as they worked, which worked really well for us. Um, I made that table simply by copying the table in Excel and pasting it, and it creates a whole bunch of post-it notes in seconds, really easy. And, and in the second one, we actually had a couple of people come in and I just added them to Excel and reposted it in while we were doing the intro talk, like it was that easy to fix during the uh, thing. You can see the activities across the top there, Zombieland, CFA, uh, uh, what is KM used for and, um, and some of the KM slides. But you also see that red bit there, I'll just quickly zoom in on that. So a lot of people are going, yeah, but what is knowledge asset management? Just as an example of this topic. So we did an infographic, we took half a day and we built this infographic about what a knowledge asset uh, is and, and who uses it and, and why is it different here at CFA and that sort of stuff and who's using it around the world. And so what you'll notice um, in the one, you've probably already seen it in the one we've got you logged into, is you can see other people's cursors. And as a facilitator, that's wonderful. You can see when their, uh, their attention moves. And, and um, it's just like Simon said, they can't help it. Their body language changes, their, you, you, and they, their mouse goes where they're reading. Uh, which is wonderful. So that ability that Mural has as well to pull everyone to where you are and to, you know, to, to um, what it was, it herding the cats together again is a really key facilitation tool. You can see there, we've got some uh, really detailed uh, mind maps that the three teams put together and, um, and uh, that works uh, pretty well. But the one we learned, and I have to, um, I'm not going to take, uh, responsibility for this is Brad came up with this idea is the three boxes at the bottom of the screen. So those are uh, interesting quotes and insights, implementation ideas and barriers and bridges. Now we put this in the first one and we call it sharing your light bulb moments and we gave everybody permission. And when you're facilitating permission is a really powerful thing. So, so we give them permission right at the beginning. If at any point in any activity, you have an idea or you think of a barrier or a bridge or, or, or uh, something to do with the implementation, dive down there, capture your idea while it's fresh in your head and then come back to where, to the rest of us. It's perfectly okay to duck out, do that and come back. And they did in droves. And then 
from workshop to workshop, everything changed here. But every workshop completely different, but we copied these three boards forward. So each workshop, the boards got more and more populated. So by workshop four, those boards were the number one takeaway of the whole project. The, the little snippets and the insights and the, and the comments and snide remarks that people felt game to share uh, were absolutely gold for that final report and were commented on by the executive when they, when they read it. So um, that's, a, that's a cool little thing you can do. Right, so let's jump over and to do that, I need access to my thing. Okay, so this is, um, uh, this is Miro Enterprise. So I just wanna quickly show you, this is what a, a room of boards, this is called a team. Um, so I'm in the performance improvement team, which is my team. You can see down the left here, I've got lots and lots of teams across the business. And the really nice thing about that is I'm the administrator, but I can assign team administrators to each one of these teams. So they can be adding and managing their team members. And if somebody leaves the team, they can remove them. Uh, we've got this single sign-in. So they sign in with their CFA logon, which means if they leave CFA, they no longer have access to this automatically, uh, which is lovely. And, um, and I can still invite team members or I can do what I've done tonight and invite external people into a board as visitors. I do not need licenses for them. In fact, most of the people at CFA don't have a license. It's just my facilitators that have a full license. They're the ones that can create the boards. They can lock things, they can hide things like Simon was showing before. A visitor can't do any of that. Uh, and so some of the things I'm doing tonight, you won't be able to do, but I'm gonna show you how they work. And, Stu, uh, and where we go. Stu, just, just quickly, um, does Miro have an ability for you to um, put a password on the access and also a time limit on how long they will have access to that board. Because so in, in, really, in, in mural, that's what you can do. That's what I love. I can that's, have... that's really good. I, I'd love that. We don't have that. Under share, you hit the share button. This is what you can do. So you can share it with your team and you can say whether it's edit, view, comment or not at all. Uh, with the whole enterprise, you can choose whether it's anyone so I can make this viewable by the enterprise. Yeah. Then I've got this anyone with a link. This is the external one. And, and I can make this view, comment, edit, no access. Yeah. And then I put a password on there. Yeah. Uh, just like I did tonight. Yeah. And, and so I can't do that. What I can do is I can come in here and I can change that to view only or comment or whatever. What, what about uh, and I can change the password, but I can't put a timer on it. And that's an awesome what, idea. What about sharing settings there? Do you click on that? Is that... Uh, oh, that's uh, so sharing, share, share, this is where you get into the detail of who's got permission. Right. You can get a little okay. bit more okay. But yep. yeah, it doesn't have a timer in it, unfortunately. I wish it did. That is a really neat, uh, neat concept. Yep. So, um, so that's how the sharing works uh, in it. Uh, you can see here that you, um, uh, I've brought you in as the, the starting thing. And if I click on my name up here, I can bring everyone to me. And now all of you will be moved to this view. So that's kind of what that looks like. Really easy to do. Um, I can click on an individual. So I can click on Beck here. Um, and I can see what Beck is looking at. So I'm following her now. So as she moves around, so you can kind of see what people are working on. You know how when you're facilitating, you can duck into somebody's breakout room and, and join in the conversation a bit. That's kind of the, the visual version of that. Um, and you've got all your tools down the left-hand side here. So uh, a lot of the lot of similar things uh, to, uh, to Mural. So I won't go into that too much. Um, these things, the white box here is called a frame. And if I move this frame about, then everything in the frame moves with it. And so that's, that's how that works. If I lock the frame, then the frame can't be moved, but everything in it is, is editable. And that's, um, uh, that's handy because you'll guarantee that as people try and move around, they end up removing, like moving all your blocks around. And when you've done this beautiful, perfectly planned activities and all of a sudden they're deconstructing it. So just uh, make sure you lock things down before it starts. These are just some ideas for how you use it for brainstorming, ideation, card sorting, where you give them a pre-link. And, and none of these stand in isolation. With the research, with the, the, the CAM uh, things we run, one of the very first activities we run is that mind mapping where we ask them to map out the knowledge categories 
and, and some of the knowledge assets that are in the organization. Then in the following uh, uh, workshops, we don't ask them to do that again. We take the ones they identified in the first workshop and we use those as the building blocks that they then do for future activities on. And so think about that. You're taking them on a journey and you're letting them speak in terms of their experiences, their, the knowledge risks that they've identified. And we reuse those and we pull it all forward. Um, relationships and captures, the really uh, good example in one of, one of the last CAM workshops we did of doing a stakeholder mapping uh, exercise and really tracking uh, who was related to who and where the flows were, which is nice. Uh, we've got the voting um, and um, uh, there are some external people in Miro that allow you similar to um, uh, the one that uh, Beck just mentioned where you can download. So this icebreaker we experienced the other night where people are given a whole bunch of heads and bodies and faces and facial hair and they can build their own little, uh, little avatar, which was a lot of fun. People really enjoyed that. And by doing that, it showed them how to use the tool. So um, I'll let you have a look around there. The, to move around on the board, you right click and drag. So use your right mouse button, click and drag and you move around. To zoom in and out like I am there, you simply roll your mouse wheel up and down. If you don't have a mouse wheel, you're using a trackpad on a computer with two fingers, you can slide up and down the trackpad and that will zoom in and out. If you've got an apple, you can actually pinch as well and that, that should move you in and out as well. Sometimes it will tell the browser to zoom in and out rather than mirror, so you just gotta be careful with that. But uh, encourage people to experiment and try on their computer because they'll have slightly different hardware and, and, and they can work out what's going on. The main thing is I often do what I'm doing now. I'll share my screen first and let them see the capability. And then in general, they work out how to do it on their machine. But uh, Luke, you mentioned, uh, I think it was Luke before about uh, the, the getting used to the online environment and a bit of fatigue in that. I, we found that within about 30 minutes, the most Luddite people were fully engaged in using pretty much 90% of the functionality. Uh, and that's the beauty of these tools. It's not how cool they are and what they can do. It's, it's how simple they've implemented it. So you can pretty much work it out yourself. Okay, that's enough of me talking. Let's have a go at our activity. So the activity tonight is to think about what sort of KM activities would we use a digital dashboard for? And then we're gonna um, have a think about which ones then we wanna have a go at. And then we're gonna have a go at, at building an activity as if we're gonna do a, a, a workshop and, and run that activity. So if you would like to come down to me and I'm gonna pull you all down to me and now I'm gonna unhide this first one. What we've got here is we have a bunch of knowledge risks and a bunch of knowledge approaches and methods. So uh, the fires on the left, the things that can go wrong, and of course the, the fire extinguisher, how do we, what sort of tools do we have to deal with those things? This is just a, uh, an example of ideation. So what I want you to do is I want you in the one below it uh, to, to pick a risk card, a problem area, pick a, uh, a matching uh, approach or method and, and stick them on your line. And then um, in the benefits and impacts, I want you to click on the text button, the T button in the top left, and put in what you think the, uh, the benefit or the impact of applying that method to the risk would be. Now you should be able to just click on any of those cards and drag them down. It won't work because they're behind. Great. So I'm just going to send this to the back. There you go. Fixed. That's it, you're doing great.
Now to start typing with the text, um, you hit the text button and then uh, uh, you, should, you should find that a text box appears in the middle of your screen and you can drag that down. Sometimes it appears really small. So you might want to zoom in and, uh, and you, you'll see uh, dots appear and you can resize that. That's it. Well done. Well done. That's great. Well done. So a couple of people are drawing notes there, pulling notes down. And uh, you can see that people are uh, accidentally dragging on the corners and creating arrows. So I'm just deleting those as facilitator. I'm just constantly cleaning up, I'm fixing little problems. I'm watching how everyone's getting involved. I'm reading and seeing if I can help people and, uh, and uh, uh, trying to keep it going. I see someone's put a nice little icon there. That's excellent. Um, I like it. I like the fact that the person doing it's called Visiting Artisan. That's very cool. Okay, so we've got some uh, things there. I'll just give you a second now just to have a read through those. What we're going to do is we're going to pick two of these to, uh, to try and create an activity uh, with in the dashboard. So I want you to have a think about uh, two things, you know, which one of these would be most important to you and which one uh, is, do you think would be most suited to doing in a digital whiteboard situation? Because this isn't all things to all, all people, right? It's, it's, it's suited to one, some things and, and not to others. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to start a little voting session. And the way I do that, is I click on my voting button and um, uh, I say I want sticky notes and I resize this to just there and I'm resizing the voting area. I'm going to give everybody three votes and you've got one minute to spend them. Now you can spend these votes on one thing or you can split them across multiple. So I'm going to hit start now and uh, and now you can click on, on one of those and you can add your votes. So whichever one you think is uh, most suited to you or you think is most suitable for a digital whiteboard activity, then uh, place your votes. Okay, so I can see that seven of 10 have voted. There's three of you left. Now I have the ability to add an extra minute to the voting and I can finish it now. So I can see everybody's voted. So I'll click end for all. No, I'll finish those off. Well done, everybody. <laughs> what it's gonna do now is give us a bit of a report. And uh, so hopefully on your screen, you can see there that Human knowledge hoarding got eight votes. Uh, knowledge hiding got six votes and human forgetting got six votes. So thanks very much for giving me a tie. This is why we give people odd numbers of votes. Uh, so do your math before you hand your votes out is what I would say there. Um, I can click on the see results. I don't know whether you can still see my screen, but um, there's, there's all the votes there and you can see them showing up on the screen. Um, which is really neat. And, and that was so easy for me to do. It's, uh, it's a really neat way to get uh, guidance on, on um, uh, people's feelings in the room. So I'm going to stick that one there as number one and make that nice and red. And then 
Um, what was the second one? Human knowledge hiding down here. And so we'll make that uh, number two. Okay, well done. So I'll close that now. Um, what we're gonna do now is we'll make this, uh, this top one here, the, uh, um, the knowledge hoarding. So I will um, hoarding and duplicate, pull that down here. And knowledge hiding, there we go, okay. So pick one of those and jump in and have a go at what you think you would do to design an activity. Now, you will have noticed something that just happened and it's happened in every single facilitated workshop I've run like this. The room was dead silent. And so that's one of the risks you have of doing these little workshops. It's very easy for everyone to be head down, bum up and just doing the online content. So what we would do at this point and what I'm about to do is I'm gonna break you into two workshops. So um, uh, we'll, uh, I'll sign, uh, where are we Simon? How do we, how do we do our workshops? I can't see the breakout rooms. I, I, think I can do it, I'll just you make can do it. Group, so, two groups and assign automatically. That's it. So group one will be doing knowledge hoarding. Group two will be doing knowledge hiding. So you'll be working in the same spreadsheet, but now you can talk to each other. And this is where you want a second facilitator. So you want a facilitator for each breakout room so you can get people talking, get them out of that silent mode. It'll take a minute. It'll take a bit of coaxing to do. So uh, Simon, do you want to set that up?
Everyone's coming back in. I know we have run a bit over time here today. Uh, I hope that's okay with everyone. Um, so yeah. Thanks guys. So um, yeah, I was aiming to finish about eight. So we've got just a couple of minutes just to sum up. And as you can see here, we're using some traditional facilitating things. We're doing the, you know, two mini all. And so we're doing an all now. Is there somebody that wants to just speak up from each of the two boards and just say how they found the experience? What, you know, one or two ideas they got from it? Maybe from activity two, somebody want to put their hand up? Sorry, I was hiding, trying to order my food, but I'll speak because I drew a scribble off someone's awesome idea about a hide and seek activity. Um, so we're thinking about like an activity where <coughs> the cough, I didn't catch it quick enough. Um, where people can do this activity to like look for the places where people might hide knowledge. But, and then we were speaking about like attitudes and behaviors, like the why, like what is the why of the hiding, not just where the stuff is hidden. So you could kind of like match it to attitudes and behaviors, like, you know, such and such has hidden something in a file share. What's the attitude and what's the behavior that matches with that? It's an awesome idea. I love it. Well done. I can only take credit for the scribble. I can't remember who suggested the hide and seek activity, but I love it. It's a group effort, the hive minded one. I love it. All right, does somebody want to talk up from uh, activity one? So uh, I could see Arthur was about to. Um, so I thought I'd jump in and just say that. Um, we, we, we try to come up with an idea around um, how could we as individuals, um, each in, in groups go off and find knowledge that in, in the game that had been set up uh, was revealed to us and then bring that back to a central area to construct something that would have been, you know, a, a cohesive uh, whole but wouldn't have been if individuals had hoarded their knowledge. Um, I'd have to say Stuart steered us in an amazing direction in the last two minutes. Um, we each had some good ideas as we went through it. One of the ideas was obviously Arthur's invisible maze, which I'd love to see on online and in an environment like this. And, and if we can somehow translate it into that, Arthur, you know, I'll be using it again. That's great. We did have some good ideas. There was the idea of, you know, do we use a carrot and a stick or whatever? Um, uh, we talked about focusing on hoarding tends to shut people down. So how do we focus on the positive side of it? But at the same time, as, as Bert pointed out, there are real implications for not sharing. So we wanted to have a bit of a, a stick there. So if, if people didn't contribute, if, we, if each of the three groups had different colours, you could see which colour wasn't contributing. So just as a real subtle thing there. So Think about the psychology of it, about, about people's egos and use that to your advantage. It's, um, it can be really, really powerful and, and done in a quite a positive way. And of course, if we played a game, like I mentioned, like Luke just mentioned then, your second round is now dealing with a real problem where people aren't pulling from somewhere else on the board. They're bringing their own knowledge to solve that. And that but they've already got the model of sharing and helping um, so that was our idea. Well, that's it, everyone. I hope you've uh, gained a bit from that. I'm going to leave this board open for you all. So if you want to play with it, you want to experiment and see what Miro can do. Miro was going to come and speak tonight, but they uh, they got hit by COVID hard up in the Sydney office and, and couldn't do it this week. They're, they're still willing to come and talk to us. I think we've had a really good cross-section tonight, so we've probably done it to death. But, um, but if you would like to be connected with Miro or Mural, just reach out. Um, and uh, they have really looked after us. Um, we have a fantastic discount because we're a volunteer organization and they've really helped us. The other thing Mural has in terms of licensing is they, we have X number of licenses, but we can use as many as we like. So I can throw an extra 50 users on, they can use Mural for a week and then I'll just take them off again. And it doesn't cost me a cent. At the end of the three, every three months, we then assess 
how many users we've got on a consistent basis and we'll adjust the number of licenses we've got. But from a government department point of view, it just makes, it fits in the budget. It works really, really nicely. And, um, and we're quite happy with the level of, uh, you know, security and everything. Um, it, the data is stored in the US, but we have rules and guidelines about not putting private information and everything on there. And um, it's been a really, really uh, good experience. Getting those key super users has been key for this spreading. So, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, any final comments from Simon or Beck before we close up? Uh, no, other than um, it was good to see uh, Miro in action. It's slightly different than navigation around, like holding the uh, the right mouse key down as opposed to a mural just um, left mouse. Um, but other than that, very, very similar tools and both as um, versatile as each other. So um, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, anyone that has any feedback or wants to uh, connect with me, I'll put my email address in the chat earlier. Uh, otherwise, just go by Stu uh, or Simon if you want, want to connect with me. So happy to continue the conversation. So I look forward to next time. Um, yeah, just to say thanks so much for having me on a topic that I love just rambling about. So thanks for letting me ramble. It's been fun. And for those of you I'm not connected with already, you can find me on LinkedIn or ask Stuart for details. Um, I could talk about this stuff all day. Great.